Uh, hello. Hello, my name is uh, John Mugno and welcome to Rye Brook Focus. Uh, our guest today is Peter Schlachtis, who's a longtime Rye Brook resident and the chairman of the Village Airport Advisory Council and a member of the Westchester County Airport Advisory Board. Peter is well versed in airport issues. He's been involved with them now for well over 15 years. And although Peter, uh, Peter is speaking in his personal capacity, I want to make sure everyone understands how well versed he is on airport issues. I am pleased that he is our guest today. Welcome, Peter. Well, welcome, John. Thank you for having me. Good. Well, Peter, uh, your participation today is very timely because I think a number of issues related to the airport have been on the back burner due to the pandemic. And they're starting to reemerge uh, just as we hope the lockdowns of our society are ending. So that's why I think that uh, it's really quite timely that you're with us today. I, I think the best approach is to briefly discuss the active issues and then discuss opportunities for village resident involvement. Let's start off with the airport master plan revision process. And could you explain to our listeners what it is and uh, what you know about its status? Sure. Um, you know, though, before I launch in, right in, you're getting us right into the weeds, John. I love it. Um, <laughs> let, let me let me start off with a couple of things. First, thank you to you and Alex and the village staff and the trustees for, for making this interview series possible. Uh, it's, it's a great service to the community. I've listened to several of your episodes of Rybrook Focus. I found value and insight in all of them. And I hope more and more our neighbors uh, tune in. Oh, uh, second, you. no, you're- We uh, do too. Well, <laughs> well deserved. Um, Second, I expect we'll, we'll be spending much of our time focusing on you know, concerns and dangers and problems at the airport, uh, the lions and tigers and bears, as it were. Uh, let me take this opportunity to give credit where credit is due. So based on my years serving on the county and the village airport boards and watchdogging the airport, uh, I just wanna share that I feel quite comfortable about the overall safety and professionalism of the airport operations I wouldn't live where I do in the Belfair community if, if I didn't. Um, the, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's where, that's gotta be really the, the starting point. Um, to be clear, the county, Westchester County owns the airport. Um, it contracts out the operation of the, of the management of the airport to a reputable national company called Avports. Top airport staff, have served here for many years. And at the county level too, there are environmental and planning and operational oversight officials who are capable and dedicated. Um, we Dealing with a facility like the county airport with all of the different stakeholders and regulations that impact it is complicated, it's challenging. And, you know, we should acknowledge that going in, uh, you know, before we start, uh, uh, critiquing and, and, and uh, uh, brainstorming ideas on how to make things better. Um, and finally, I just need to acknowledge that I am an airport user myself. Um, it's convenient, no doubt about it. Um, you could never build the airport where it is today, literally across the street from the Kensico Reservoir, which holds the drinking water for, for millions of New Yorkers, including many of us in Southern Westchester, but like many of us in this village, I accept that the airport was here before me and indeed long before the village <laughs> formed. Um, so no one's aiming to do away with the airport. We just need it to be a good neighbor, you know, and to not increase the risks and damage and dangers by expanding. Um, right. And really that's not asking for more than what county policy has been going back at least to 2003 when the county legislature passed a resolution codifying its already pre-existing no expansion policy on the airport. So as residents, we have a right to demand that the county adhere to its own policies. Right. 
And, right. uh, and does that bring us to the airport master plan? Because that's really yes. going to be a statement of their policies, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the master plan is is a, you know, it's a vision statement for the airport. It's an analysis of the needs that are anticipated for aviation locally and regionally, um, the, the resources and infrastructure that the airport has, um, opportunities and challenges to align those together and, you know, what, what might want to be changed, what might the county want to change at the airport in order for the airport to, you know, fulfill its functions, but also protect, uh, you know, it, its environmental and community neighbors um, doing that. And, and the, the problem and the reason that the master plan which by the way, is not binding, but just like a, you know, a vision plan for the village, right? It's still very influential because when plans are made to the extent that they're in keeping with the master plan, they automatically have extra momentum behind them. And to the extent that they are, uh, they, are count they run counter to the master plan, they've got steeper headwinds uh, to face. So it matters, but it's not, you know, it, it is not, um, um, what you see in the master plan is not necessarily going to happen. Um, it is simply, again, like a vision statement. Um, the, the master plan was most recently submitted to the FAA which requires all airports to have master plans um, about three years ago um, at the beginning of the current uh, county administration. Um, after, frankly, many years of stop and start development uh, under the prior administration, and before that it had been you know, well over a decade, maybe two, before there had been another master plan. So the FAA was on the on our backs to update our master plan. Um, the problem was, uh, and this was something that the village of Rybrook is on record about, was that opportunities for public input into what the master plan should contain were very, very limited. Um, really, uh, you know, there was literally one meeting when the, when the master plan had been all but completed um, at the county center uh, to fulfill the barest minimum legal requirement of, of what could be uh, heard from residents. And so the current county uh, executive um, promised to revisit this after a series of town hall meetings, including one at, at the, uh, at the village, uh, you know, the village offices, uh, right. village hall. Um, and, you know, that was supposed to have been completed, you know, beforehand, uh, the county, but then the pandemic intervened, or sorry, it would have been com com completed by now, but the pandemic intervened. Um, but I will say that true to their word, the administration uh, hired two consultants for this round of master plan development. One, the normal technical, you know, folks who would slice and dice the data on usage and economics and, and all the rest. Uh, and the other, a specialist in public engagement on issues of, you know, um, public works and municipal initiatives, et cetera. Um, and you know, I was invited uh, as a member of the county board to be part of the process by which uh, bidders for that contract were vetted. Um, and uh, you know, I, I was certainly pleased with what I saw. Um, and and I, 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 you know, I feel like the firm that got selected uh, is a good one, uh, well qualified. And so I do expect a robust public engagement process. Um, once the process, you know, re reboots, um, and I think that you know we've been 
we've been sort of waiting for that to happen now for some time, but the county uh, is mindful that it, it, it wants the, you know, the greatest cross section of people to be able to feel free to not only voice their concerns, but also learn, you know, learn more about what the issues are before they, before they get involved. So they're looking to have different forums where people can come and learn and dialogue with the consultants and county officials. And, you know, the conditions for that uh, just keep getting pushed back. Um, most recently, I heard uh, the county was saying that they're, they're reconsidering this almost on a weekly basis, but it may not happen until the spring, just based on how pandemic conditions play out. The, the thing that they want to avoid the most is starting the process a second time, only having to stop it a second time and then, you know, go from there. So they want to, they want the codes to be clear. Is there any particular pressure from the uh, FAA about when this needs to be completed or do they understand the delay is occasioned by the, the pandemic? So when the new administration came into power um, about, you know, several months in, they took that pressure off the county by submitting the master plan, the, the, the new master plan that the prior administration had uh, developed to the FAA with a cover letter that simply said, the current county government uh, doesn't feel that this is, you know, a, a great, you know, a, a great reflection of, uh, you know, of what the master plan should be. But it did check the boxes. So the FAA is on notice that revisions may be coming, but the county is in compliance. And so, no, there's no specific pressure from the FAA. But it sounds like the way the process is going to develop is that there'll be many opportunities for village residents, indeed Westchester residents, to have some, some input into uh, what the final conclusions are. You're right, John. And I think, you know, this is a big opportunity and also a challenge for the village and, and our neighbors here, because uh, the question is, what will we do with that opportunity? If we are complacent and only a fraction of us engage and go on record about what we want, um, then, you know, the flip side of aggressive public engagement is that the county is going to be looking for input, not only from those of us near the airport, but from people in New Rochelle and Yonkers and Peekskill and all over. Uh, those folks, you know, hopefully will get educated enough to know that, you know, there's more to it than just uh, the convenience of, of, of flying where they want to fly without having to go into the city um, or all the way up to Stewart. But, you know, that you would hope that it would be, it would become better known that, you know, the drinking water uh, down there depends on um, there not being any big aviation ex uh, accidents involving the reservoir next to the airport. But we, you know, we can't, we can't know for certain. All we can do is try to make sure that Rybrook's voice is heard as loudly and clearly as possible. Uh, whatever it is people feel they want, you know, I'm not here to prejudge, um, you know, which, which, uh, which way people would like the airport to go, to uh, get bigger, to get smaller, to stay roughly the same. But, you know, regardless, this will be our chance to be heard. And, you know, just like 15 years ago, uh, when I first got involved in airport issues, the county had this plan to improve the de-icing of airplanes. Hey, that's like, you know, motherhood in apple pie. De-icing airplanes. You know, where's the bad in that? But the way they were going to go about doing it not only was tremendously and unnecessarily disruptive to the Rybrook communities and, and others around the airport. But it actually, you know, we felt contained dangers of having planes have to cross the runway 
or travel longer distances before after being de-iced. It, 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 it seemed to us, and we were able to gather enough funds to get expert advice on this that, um, you know, that certainly supported our, our concerns, that the airport had a bunch of federal money and was trying to find a juicy project um, to spend that money on. Um, and some other concerns got uh, shortchanged. Well, we made a, you know, we, we mobilized in a very short amount of time because, of course, you never find out about these things until it seems the last moment. And we were able to actually put a stop by forming a, a coalition um, of, of neighborhood and environmental groups, came together very quickly, mobilized, and managed to convince the county to change course. And that intervention, um, we were told by our, our local uh, county representatives for years, influenced county decision making um, because there was this sense that, you know, hey, if you didn't, if you didn't think carefully about the impacts on Rybrook, you know, they could, the, the, the bees would come out uh, after you again and, you know, and do so intelligently and effectively. Um, we have another opportunity, you know, that, but over time, I think that has waned. And, and the master plan is really our opportunity to put ourselves back on the map. And I hope we take advantage of it by engaging. Right. What, what, uh, what kind of detail, I've read the original draft, not the, the original draft, that'd be mistaken, the Astorino administration draft of the master plan in part, <laughs> it's very long, but uh, it's both, it's technical and it's somewhat detailed, but it's, it needs an interpreter, I would say. How are we going, how would the village, the typical village resident come to understand what even the issues are? Can the village itself uh, play a role in summarizing, for example, or how do you envision that working? Well, you know, I don't think that the process is going to be, here are 20 chapters of the master plan, what do you think? Um, you know, I, I, the public engagement process is going to be iterative in the sense that it's going to start out asking the public some very basic questions that don't require technical knowledge. But, you know, how do you, you know, how would you balance the desire for, you know, um, the, the you know, convenient nearby flights with potential environmental and quality of life and public health concerns stemming from noise and air pollution and water pollution and the rest of it. So um, you're, you're, excuse me to interrupt, but you're envisioning a countywide survey? Uh, yeah. I, think there, I think there almost certainly will be a survey uh, that, that seemed to be getting off the ground right before they, uh, you know, they, they suspended activity. So I do believe though, and there probably will be a couple of surveys. So in other words, they'll, they'll try to understand how people use the airport, what people care about or are concerned about when they think of the airport. Um, and what they'll, what they'll do is take that initial input and start developing, uh, ideas to, that could go into a, rev a, a revised master plan. And then I think the plan is to bring some of those ideas back to the public to, you know, kind of do a, 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 uh, a sound check. Um, and be able to, you know, also do course correction as necessary if, if they appear to have misinterpreted the earlier data. So uh, I think certainly people are going to be invited to opine on, you know, whatever aspects of the airport they want to. Um, but I don't think, you know, and, and certainly the village and I think, you know, the airport council that you and I both serve on, uh, we'll be looking for how we can, how we can help. Um, 
but I don't think it will be necessary to become an instant expert on technical matters around the airport. Um, and I hope that, that that's good news to me. Uh, there's plenty I don't know still at this point. Uh, uh, it's, it's probably not that much you don't know, Peter. But let, let's just move on to a topic which is a little technical, but I think gets to what a lot of people are concerned about. And that's the terminal use agreement. Uh, could you talk about what's the impact of that on airport operations? Sure. Um, so I think the starting point for this is that in 1990, Congress passed an, a law that still governs a lot and is a framework for a lot of aviation law and regulation to this day. It basically took away, well, in exchange for airlines and, and aviation manufacturers promising to invest in technology uh, to reduce uh, air, airplane engine noise and such, um, it took away a lot of the control that local airport operators and owners had over how their airport would be used. And so ever since then, it's sort of a, a starting point that once you have, once you've built an airport, you have to let them come. Uh, as long as, as, as long as it's safe, uh, that your infrastructure, your, your runways and what have you al allow for safe landings and takeoffs, you can't decide who comes and who goes or limit the use of your airport. So there are, with very few exceptions. And one of those exceptions uh, we are fortunate to have is that because we had, we were one of the few airports that had strict written rules about limiting the number of airline flights or airline passengers that could be, uh, that could be flown in and out during a given hour or half hour and how many gates there were at the airport. Um, these, had been, these had been issues that had been, been debated locally for a lot of years because you know, traditionally, even though Westchester Airport is bigger than LaGuardia in terms of landmass, it's got a runway dating back to World War II that's longer than Chicago Midway, but it has essentially been a fairly sleepy you know, county airport focused on private aviation, some corporate aviation, et cetera. And the big jets and commercial aviation really, you know, came late in the day. Um, and from the beginning, there was controversy over whether that was an appropriate use of the airport. So rules were put in place to limit it. And after the 1990 law was passed, um, ultimately, we were able to get uh, court recognition and, in, and aviation and airline recognition that our rules were grandfathered in. So the terminal use agreements or, or terminal use regulation um, are basically the codification of those rules and the, the process to deal with uh, you know, how to allocate um, limited capacity for flights, for airline flights at the airport in a fair way. So the bottom line is you can only have a limited number of passengers in planing or deplaning during any half hour. You can only have a limited number of gates. And there's a lottery system for when multiple airlines, uh, you know, want to use the same slot, as it were. Uh, and that prevents, you know, that has for a long time served as a partial check on, you know, how impactful the airport is, you know, to surrounding communities in terms of noise and air emissions and the rest. But it mainly or entirely affects commercially commercial aircraft? Yeah, let's be clear. This, all, these rules only applied to commercial airlines. So, because again, at the time, you know, back in the day, uh, the little corporate jets or little corporate propeller planes and private planes were not the big concern. Um, 
And most of the airport was dedicated to that. To this day, 80% of the flights in and out of Westchester County Airport are not airlines. They're what's known as general aviation, which in, includes corporate and charter and private aviation, um, including, by the way, big outfits like NextJets or um, FlexJets, which are kind of timeshare private jets um, that, that you know, involve a lot of bigger planes you know, in, a, in quite frequent flights, but they're not covered by the TUA, by those restrictions on the airlines. So one, so, one other thing I should add is that the TUA also restricts airline operation to the main terminal. So there shouldn't be uh, airline, you know, ticketed passenger service coming out of the various other private terminals at the airport other than in very small planes. Now, does the terminal use agreement have, have a term or does it have to be renegotiated periodically or is it so, kind of everything? So there's a, there's a law on the books uh, that the county passed that's the basis for this that has no expiration date, but the agreements with the airlines to respect that law and not to challenge it in court, those do have uh, end dates and they have been renegotiated in the past. And, you know, I think it, it's important to say that those are agreements are due to sunset in the next couple of years. So it will be, you know, one of, one of my uh, priorities to try to make, to try to uh, press the county administration to not, you know, play with fire, not wait till the last minute um, and to figure out how we get those extended, um, you know, or to use their leverage to pressure the airlines to go along with, with further extensions. Um, I think there, I think the county has plenty of leverage to use and it's a matter of, you know, going ahead and using it. Mm. But this, uh, as you, you say, is mainly for the commercial aircraft that people can buy a ticket on. Uh, but it, the rest of the uh, airport operations are basically only limited by the capacity of the airport. Exactly. There are no restrictions other than the capacity of the airport to safely uh, you know, safely handle those planes. The biggest, uh, you know, and by the way, cap so capacity, of course, has to do with, you know, hangar space, um, you know, runways. Um, and, uh, you know, people I think might be surprised to know that the, that even more than the private and corporate planes that are based at the airport, uh, airport traffic, the largest single component uh, are visiting planes, visiting private aircraft, visiting corporate aircraft. Um, they make up the biggest slice uh, of airport operations. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they either will utilize a private hangar or a tie down um, at various facilities around the airport beyond just the passenger terminal that most of us are familiar with. Right. So there could be and this is one reason why residents need to pay attention, there could be an expansion of that type of activity under the current rules that govern the operations of the airport? Um, yeah, I would, I would say it, it is very fair to say that the existing capacity of the airport can handle significantly greater volume than than we're seeing, or than that we've seen even in several years. And I'm talking about before the pandemic. Um, when, when discussions about noise, for example, come up at, at county meetings especially, it's very often pointed out that the number of flights in and out of Westchester has decreased significantly since, uh, you know, the early, since the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and therefore some people are credulous that, uh, 
you know, why should, why should people be complaining about noise now? You know, after all, there are fewer flights and engine technology has gotten better. Uh, and it's, it's, like the, it's like the old parable of the blind men and the elephant. Um, depending on what, what part you're focused on is, is how you believe the reality uh, of the beast to be. Um, mm. if, you're, if, you're, if you've got your hand on the side of the elephant, it's a wall, but if you've got your hand on the trunk of the elephant, it's a, it's a hose and, you know, on and on and on from there. So I think people in aviation, uh, you know, have a tendency, you know, sometimes to be dismissive. Uh, I've seen, I've seen a lot of examples of that at county meetings where, where residents from various towns and villages have come to express their, um, you know, to, to express how upset and, and distraught they are over how their life has been impacted by, by airport traffic. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there are factors like the size of planes. Part of the reason why there are fewer planes in, is that the, the size of the average plane is bigger. Uh, of course, if you have enough bigger planes, you're talking about even with even with technology improving, if the size of the engine uh, is, 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 is getting even larger and outstripping the technology improvement, you're talking about more noise, more impact. Um, and then there's, you know, and then there's uh, experts who have told us that part of making, part of making today's planes, um, even though the engines might be quieter pound for pound, um, the way the planes are designed means that as they come in for a landing, they're, a, they're actually louder. And again, bigger planes displacing more air will tend to be louder. So you've got a lot of factors going on that are challenging to, to diagnose. Um, but I will say that I think that for the first time in many years, there are people at all levels, at the county uh, advisory board level, at the county administration level, the county legislature, who are you know who are listening with a an open mind and a sympathetic mind, and and even the aviation community has has responded uh, in this new environment and come up with uh, suggestions of their own, such as uh, alternative flight paths, which is I think something uh, you you said you might ask about. Okay, that's good. Uh, <clears throat> Now, there's an, another issue that emerged just last spring and is now subject to legal action. So not sure what, what can be said about that at this time, but there was a proposal by a company called Millionaire to build a second hangar at the airport. What, uh, <clears throat> what does Millionaire do? And what, what concerns would an additional hangar raise? Right, so... Uh, the good news is I'm not a party to the lawsuit, so I'm under, I'm, I'm under no gag order, uh, but I'm also not privy, uh, you know, of course, to any of the, uh, the details of, of, of where that, where that suit is at the moment, other than it, it seems clear from everything I've been told that the county is standing firm, resisting, uh, millionaires demands that it be allowed to build this, this new hangar. Of course, it claims that it's, um, it's simply making changes to an existing hangar. Um, and I suppose if you, if you consider ripping down all the walls and all, the entire roof and uh, enlarging the foundation and rebuilding essentially a new building as you know, minor changes, then, then they have a point. Um, but bottom line is there their piece of the, they have land on the far side of the airport, on the Harrison side, uh, on the other side of the main runway from the passenger terminal that most of us deal with. Um, and that land historically was leased to two uh, private companies to focus on private, private general aviation and to make sure that private planes had the ability to gas up and tie down and you know be be parked in hangars and things like that. 
Uh, their operation is called a fixed base operator or FBO. Um, some, some people in the aviation industry, you know, constantly say it's a, uh, it's a fancy name for a glorified gas station at the airport uh, for private planes, but it's more than that. It's, it's a, a lounge and a, a place to meet, have a business meeting. It's, um, you know, a place to put up your staff if you've got staff who are, you know, flying your planes. Um, it's, it's shelter and, and maintenance for the planes, et cetera. Um, so they, they built a, a very fancy new lounge area, uh, terminal, uh, and they, next to it, they built a very large, they, they, again, took some existing smaller hangars designed for small private planes and replaced it with a very big, uh, new hangar, uh, that also covered up what used to be a parking lot there that's designed for some of the largest, you know, private jets that are, you know, not all that different from, uh, from some commercial airline planes. Um, and they want to build another, they want to do essentially the same thing and build another one. Uh, and they claim that there was a verbal agreement with the prior administration um, that, that confirmed that a new hangar would be uh, deemed a change to the old existing hangar, which, which is which they haven't even allowed private planes to use for years. You know, it's just abandoned at this point. Um, but and, and this, by the way, you know, small private aviation, you know, small private pilots of smaller planes have complained to me for years that the options available to them. Uh, at the airport are, are really very limited, uh, expensive, and uh, it's, it's really a question mark as to why the county would not want this hangar to be in use serving, you know, existing, existing patrons of the airport. But Millionaire um, tried to, uh, you know, about a, well, about a year ago, began a lobbying campaign um, to try to get the county administration, the county legislature to back down over, you know, the new administration came in and said, wait, we, we don't buy this verbal agreement with the old, with the old crew. Um, this is not in your contract. And so you need to get it. You need a new contract, which the county legislature has to approve. So they started a lobbying campaign. And that lobbying campaign kind of melted down in the spring when it came out that the environmental approvals required for the first hangar had never been complied with. Um, never mind the second one. Um, but you, you, you think, just to interrupt, you think the impact of this expansion or second hangar, however you want to characterize it, would be to give them more capacity to have more flights. Well, it's it's a hundred percent clear that there would be more larger planes based at the airport, uh, more larger, noisier planes based at the airport, um, and you know, in theory, you could try to make the argument that if we could just get the right planes in that hangar, then you know maybe these are planes that won't be used very often. Or maybe these are planes that are based in, an, on a, in a nearby airport that have to fly in and out to Westchester to pick up Westchester people. Uh, and if they're based in Westchester, then they, don't, you know, then they don't have to come in and out so much to do the same work. So these are the arguments that Millionaire was trying to make. The problem is their first, uh, the first hangar they built, there is scant evidence uh, of achieving those goals. Uh, just from a general point of view, kind of like we were talking about an airport has to accept whomever. Um, I don't think that Millionaire has to accept whomever, but once the county allows Millionaire to build that hangar, it has very little control over how the hangar ultimately gets used and very little ability to prevent the hangar from winding up supporting uh, planes that produce uh, considerably more and noisier flights in and out of the airport. 
And, mm -hmm. and Millionaire uh, was invited by the County Airport Advisory Board to engage on that. And, and you know, instead, uh, I mean, they, they, they came once and presented their pitch. They were invited back, but in the, in the meantime, they decided to sue the county instead. Well, well, that's something to keep an eye on, I guess. It's going, it's going through the court, so we don't know when there'll be any resolution, I assume. Correct. And, you know, my sense is, you know, uh, if I had to guess, I would say that, you know, in, in part, this is all about, you know, the best defense being a good offense. Millionaire uh, is on the defensive about the environmental uh, violations that it is now having to rectify with its current facilities. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course it has its own stakeholders and shareholders that were, you know, I think expecting a second uh, facility there who, uh, you know, who I'm sure may be disappointed. So uh, the lawsuit is, uh, you know, perhaps an attempt to, to, to provide, you know, justification. But we do have to keep, we do have to keep an eye. The fact of the matter is there's a lot of stuff going on at the airport that we have to keep an eye on. During, during some years when uh, in the prior administration, uh, there, were contra there were leases that were signed for 15, 25 years uh, on, hang on existing hangars at the airport that don't contain, you know, what many of us would feel would be common sense provisions on, uh, you know, on how to, you know, make sure that those, those facilities are used um, to the best advantage, you know, in particular, why not, you know, why not uh, dedicate facilities to Westchester based businesses, you know, there are plenty of Connecticut and New York City uh, based folks that, that come up um, to use the airport. Um, and then, then we have businesses saying, hey, we want, we want, we want to come to Westchester or we want to stay in Westchester, but we want our own facilities at the airport. And meanwhile, the airport, you know, is, is maxed out. So now the only option some is, is said to be building new facilities. Of course, that's the, that's the slippery slope that leads right. to a, a much busier airport. Yeah, it's very interesting and also a developing issue, which I'm sure you'll be monitoring. Um, Look, let's turn to what, you know, is usually the main issue you hear about from people, which is aircraft noise. And we have, uh, I guess uh, you probably know the statistic, a high percentage, I believe, of landings take place over Rye Brook. Uh, takeoffs are more dispersed, but is that true? Yes. Uh, traditionally, 60% or more of landings uh, come in over Rybrook, and that's really dependent on wind conditions. You know, planes take off and land into the wind. So depends, you know, on, on a given season or day or even hour, which way the winds are blowing. But there are prevailing winds. Um, it used to be actually worse. So there's a more even split now than there used to be. Um, and over the last, it's interesting, over the last number of years, because there have been more planes flying in the other way from the north, those communities have mobilized and uh, flooded the county with noise complaints. Um, right. Whereas Rybrook has been pretty docile, actually, um, not because you know we don't hear the noise, but I think you know noise is very relative. You know, it's what you're used to um, and, you know, or what you sort of are conditioned to accept. And um, so for us, it's, it's more or less been a constant. When I look at the, you know, the latest noise study that the county did, and by the way, kudos to the current administration for doing a noise study and an air emission study after many years where that wasn't done. Um, so the, the noise study shows, I think, pretty status quo figures over Rybrook and, and some increases, some decreases right. in some places, but some increases to the north. So- Do you, do you think though, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
No, that's okay. When when planes take off over Rybrook, uh, they don't take off in a straight line like they come in in a straight line. The traffic patterns divert them around uh, to the south and west over Purchase in order to not interfere with traffic involving LaGuardia and Kennedy and Newark. Now, do you think, uh, Peter, it would be advantageous for Rye Brook if, in fact, some greater number of residents actually registered noise complaints? You know, for many years, I think I, like many others, said, nobody's listening. Nothing's happening. Nothing changes when I make a noise complaint. I don't even hear back uh, when I hear a noise complaint. So why bother? You know, we're just knocking our heads against the wall. And I have to say, as a result of being involved, I can, I can tell you that is 180 degrees uh, not true. Hmm. So the county, the airport officials and the county officials are looking at those numbers every month. And it's not just the number of complaints. They're looking at the, where the complaints are coming from and how many different households are making complaints. Right. I mean, there are a couple of households that make an astonishing number of complaints. Um, there's technology now that facilitates that, including a little gadget uh, called the button. Um, that uh, you know you can get for a few bucks online, and it literally can can make the process of of registering a complaint into pushing a button. But even before, but anyway, the point is is that I have seen county policy change, and I have seen the county initiate and support um, real action to try to make a difference based on noise complaints. And so my advice to people is, and, and, and is to make use of that. Don't worry about doing a thousand a month uh, or you know every plane that goes over your house. But if we had, if we literally, if we had, a, uh, instead of a dozen, if we had a hundred or 200 homes in Rybrook registering complaints it, even a couple of the most bothersome ones each month, that would totally change the conversation at the right. county level. And just to make sure everyone heard, heard what you said, the product uh, which you can get online is called simply the button. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, here. While, while we're talking, I'll try to, to bring it up. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not here to advertise for any particular. Uh, no, but I, if people want to get one, how do yeah, they? If, if you Google, them? right? If you Google airplane noise button, you will you will get to this product. But there are other ah, there okay. are other easy ways to um, there are other easy ways. So, for example, uh, if you Google Westchester County Airport noise complaint, you'll be taken to a site and you can file the noise complaint in you know, a couple of minutes. Or if you want to take advantage one time spending an extra minute or two, you can register yourself. And then you can go back to the site. If you, book, you know, bookmark the site, you can go back to the site and put a new complaint in in a matter of seconds because you know, it automatically uh, expedites your login. And then once you log in, all your information other than the time of day uh, and, and what the problem, you know, all you have to do is put in the time of day and what the problem is pretty much. So it only takes a few seconds. You can even, you can even shortcut it more than that. There's a website called WebTrack, uh, Web T-R-A-K. And this is a service that the airport itself subscribes to. Um, you can, let's say you're, you know, you're at a, uh, on, an, on an evening barbecue or you're uh, lying in bed at night and you just feel like that plane was unusually loud. Maybe they were flying too low. Who knows? Um, you could actually ignore it. Maybe note the time approximately. Go to WebTrack 
the next uh, morning. And you can very easily then go back and see what plane was over your house around 2 a.m. or around 7 p.m. or whenever you think it was. Um, you can, and then you can go further if you're registered with the noise complaint, you can click on the icon for that plane on the, on the map. Um, and essentially in two clicks, you can say, I want to register a complaint for that plane. Oh, uh, okay. Well, and that, that, yeah. <clears throat> that sounds like a good potential action step for anyone who's interested in, in registering their view on at least the noise issue. For sure, okay. and, and my hope would be is that the, we're, that the airport council and the village will work together in, in the coming you know, month or two. Um, now that we have made, we've made progress towards a revamped um, you know, website page for airport related issues and the airport council. And the plan is to include uh, these types of options and instructions uh, right. for people there. Well, our, our time here is almost up, Peter, but I'm wondering if there's any, anything you'd like to add, anything we haven't discussed, final comments? Well, um, look, first off, when we talk about the, you know, the flight, whether, whether noise complaints uh, are worthwhile, there is an entire working group and a dialogue with the FAA going on about alternative flight paths to the north of the airport. Uh, directly resulting from the volume of noise complaints that came from communities north of the airport. Um, so, I'll, you know, we don't have to dive into all the details on that. And the good news is none of that is likely to impact Rybrook uh, directly at all. But it would be a lovely precedent if we could see actual action being taken to uh, mitigate uh, noise impacts on communities affected by the airport. In terms of... Uh, in terms of other uh, final comments, um, uh, just, a, just a few, bear with me. Uh, first, I would say it's easy to take away from this discussion that Rybrook mainly cares about quality of life issues like noise, uh, even though, frankly, no, there's you know, plenty of science to show that noise is really a public health issue. But we should, we should, not, we should keep in mind that the airport poses even bigger risks for us in terms of public health the environment and even financially. Um, you may, you know, people may not know, but New York State designated our airport as a brownfield, which is one notch down from a Superfund site, due to high levels of PFAS chemical contamination in the groundwater there. Let me stress, all evidence points towards little or no, negligible or no impact on our drinking water in the Kensico Reservoir, but water wells for buildings around the airport have been declared off limits. The airport, as we mentioned, lies across the street from the reservoir. Um, and the county and state are working together and spending large sums to keep contaminants away from the reservoir. Other communities though, haven't been so lucky like Kingston, New York, which saw its reservoir shut down from exactly the same time of contaminants. And this is not the first time that there have been dangerous chemical contaminants at the airport, which after all is a, a big industrial facility. Um, not to mention again, greenhouse gas and, and pollution emissions from the airport and airplanes and the, uh, the activity that they, they generate all around. Um, and finally, there's the, there's the potential, heaven forbid, a, pl a plane went down into the reservoir, um, forgetting the immediate impacts on the water, uh, you know, that New York City controls that reservoir and New York City is exempt from water filtration, uh, which is something that the federal government can remove at any time. And I've spoken to New York City officials and it would be a multi-billion dollar project to have to put in a water filtration plant um, to service New York City from the Kensico. So, you know, that would hit us all who use that water. It would hit us all in our pocketbooks, in our wallets, and it would be a gut punch to the economy. So, you know, we need to care about the airport for reasons other than, you know, how it may convenience our travel plans or inconvenience our sleep and, and socializing. Um, but I would like to say it is not all doom and gloom. So, you know, there, there is that working group looking at alternative flight paths to the north. There's this commitment to revisiting the master plan. Um, 
to include much greater public input. Uh, there are the new studies that I mentioned on noise and emissions and groundwater testing uh, that the current administration has conducted. And um, just last week, and this is of particular note to our village, uh, we were told that a number of projects at the airport are winding up that combined should go a long way towards reducing or eliminating these foul odors that some near the airport have been complaining about in winters and spring. Uh, these acrid odors are linked to de-icing chemicals breaking down and the projects at the airport are designed to capture far more of those chemicals and to enable the ones that get into um, the drainage basins to decompose there before they, they you know, before they, they head our way. Um, so things, things can, you know, positive change can happen. And I should point out that we can also measure success by what hasn't happened at the airport. So for example, um, you know, in addition to that, the old de-icing initiative I spoke about, many other initiatives have been quashed when residents and municipalities around the airport have spoken up. Um, uh, just a couple of years ago, there was a big push to privatize the airport and that has been, uh, you know, that has been suspended. So with luck and great effort, it is sometimes possible to race ahead and win on a specific issue, but people should understand that change happens slowly, you know, due in large part to how much the FAA is really in control of what goes on at the airport. You know, we can control what's built at the airport, but once it's built, we have very little control over how it gets used. So it's best to think in terms of marathons, not sprints when it comes to, when it comes to the airport. And it's also, um, you know, it's also good to remember that uh, just because you think an, an, an issue has been resolved uh, doesn't mean that like, you know, Jason in some horror movie, the corpse isn't gonna get back up as soon as you turn your back. Um, that is the importance of having watchdog groups like the Village Airport Council and non-government groups like the Coalition to Prevent Westchester Airport Expansion. So I hope more and more Rybrook Village residents find ways to let the county know that we are watching, that we care, and that we will hold our public officials accountable about what happens at the airport. Right. Well, that's, that's absolutely true, Peter, and thank you for spending time with us today. I will say this is a good lesson in civics for many of our residents. Uh, you can't have an impact on these types of public issues without having people like yourself willing to make an investment in learning enough details about what's going on to be able to make informed uh, comments to the in this is our case, the county government about the use of the airport. So thank you, thank you personally, but also for everyone else who's listening, you know, this is kind of what it takes for any issue to, if you want to have an impact. I appreciate right. it. All I will say is that my, the ability for people like me to have an impact is directly proportional to, um, you know, being able to get the rank and file, you know, residents and neighbors to speak up and show up uh, when it's needed. And I, I would again, just bring us back to the beginning of the conversation, whether it's in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, the master plan public engagement process is gonna roll out and uh, we need all hands on deck for that. Well, that's a very good advice. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, John, for the opportunity. Take care. <laughs>